Welcome to the broadcast, my dear fruits. I've been in communication with Princess Elizabeth of Yugoslavia's daughter, who has recounted a tale that has been doing the rounds for decades but never confirmed. A tale that I touched on previously in a broadcast. And Christina Oxenberg has very kindly responded to the notion I put forth, which is the rumour that she drove Princess Michael of Kent's horse into a lamppost, thereby killing the horse. Now, this rumour has been something of an urban myth and legend for decades. It is royal folklore. It used to go all around the gay clubs and the drag clubs back when they weren't so, impol when they weren't so politically correct and you'd have a real kiki over it. Because Princess Michael of Kent, as well as being one of my favourites, is something of a camp icon, my dear. Partly because of her title, her name as a Michael, and partly because of her glamorous diva-esque appearance, if you will. You know, it's too much fabulousness. She's six foot in height as well. Uh, one could, in some ways, mistake her for a drag queen. And I don't mean that as any disparagement. Some of the finest, most beautiful women in the world could be mistaken for drag queens. So she has that element to her that gives the fascination for some of the gays, you see. And it's great timing because just today the princess has hit the headlines here in the kingdom for refusing to eat a Chelsea bun or any of the delights at the World Chelsea Bun Awards. <laughs> only Princess Michael. This could only be Princess Michael. Well, you see, she had agreed to step in at the last minute and cover her daughter-in-law, Lady Sophie, at the awards. But she told them when she was asked to sample all the goods and cakes and pastries, I wasn't told by my daughter-in-law that I was going to do a taste because I am not going to taste. <laughs> that is why I love her. That is why the gays love her, the old queens. And I also felt that today she had an air of Lauren Bacall about her. Yes, lovely Lauren. It was never unusual to have a kiki over this rumoured fable. Well, I have found out all the details for you, my dear. And if you don't think it's the kind of thing that's going to tickle you, you don't have to watch. But I shall be presenting the information I've been told for the very first time by the actual woman that was there as a child. I will be presenting it to you in the form of a story time and taking my time over the recounting of it. Yes, I will. And I do thank the Princess Elizabeth of Yugoslavia's daughter for entrusting me with that information and responding to my request to know, to really know what happened. Very exciting for me, very exciting. First of all, ooh la la, the French visit has been confirmed. Their Majesties will be attending the 20th to the 22nd of September. It's been rescheduled, you'll see. And it's going to be two days of wonderful goings on. I can't wait to see what Her Majesty's going to be wearing, some lovely gowns, I hope. And I also thought that it was very touching that an airport in France, the Le Touquet Paris Plage Airport, International Airport, is going to be renamed, or should I say prefixed, with Elizabeth II, or La Reine Elisabeth II is going to be part of the prefix, which I think is a lovely, lo lovely tribute. Thank you, France. Merci, merci, mes chéris. J'adore! As for the Sussex boy, I hear he's going to be delivering a speech at the Well Child Awards in London on September the 7th, which just so happens to be the anniversary of the late Queen's death, the eve of that anniversary. Can you, Adam and Eve it? And actually, I can't blame him, unfortunately. I can't blame him for the clash of dates, because, you know, he's going to be eating up the headlines the next morning, because he'll be basking in the late Queen's glories and probably putting her name into his gob the night before these uh, well child awards, isn't it? I can't blame him because it was these awards exactly a year ago when the late Queen died on the 8th of September that he had to cancel at the last minute and rush off and try and skedaddle and get up to Aberdeen and then on to Balmoral. It was too late to see the late Queen while she lived and breathed, but it was that same award ceremony. So that's the time of year that it goes on. It is what it is. It's, it's said that Meghan will not be joining him for that portion of the trip. She's going to fly over from California and join him after he arrives in Dusseldorf a few days later for Invictus that begins on the 9th. Honestly, why can't he just stay away? But while he is on the soil of the United Kingdom, he will have to put in a request and queue up with the Hyperloid. 
and the peasants and the paupers, my dear, because no longer is he entitled to just stay at royal lodgings and royal digs on his own account, on his own whim. No, since he was chucked out of Throgmore, he can just hop about like the toad ears, looking for somewhere to lay that, that auburn head of his, my dear. Can I suggest Airbnb, Harry? You might want to try Airbnb if you can't afford an hotel or if your friends won't put you up or if you must make other arrangements. But I expect he'll try and sidle into some part of a royal estate that'll have him. Well, thankfully we have the Waleses because they are going to be conducting a rather more classy affair, an engagement outside of London on the 8th, during which her late... Majesty's death will be acknowledged and mentioned but they're not going to make a great big meal of it and isn't it wonderful that they just have the instinct in their character for these kind of occasions not to make it all about them they don't have that vulgarity that the Sussexes have of basking in the afterglow of the late Lizzie's death that is how they are trying to sell themselves and merch themselves especially Harry and William and Catherine have no desire to do that and they have no need to do that because William is going to be his majesty Harold he's going to be his majesty and guess what Duchess Sussex guess what old Rachel Catherine is going to be queen so bow down and kiss the ring my dear kiss both of the rings and get your tongue in there do you understand do you understand get it got it good okay so now to story time put the kettle on pull up a throne as I reveal for the very first time exactly what happened with Princess Michael's horse that was supposedly driven into a lamppost and killed by Christina Oxenberg. The truth is here. The truth is here, my dear. So here we go. It was springtime at Richmond Park, just on the outskirts of London. It was springtime, possibly 1979 possibly 81 but I'll get to that a little bit later and little Christina Oxenberg was lunching with her mother Princess Elizabeth of Yugoslavia she was lunching with her at Ormley Lodge just on the outskirts of Richmond Park in Ham Common they were lunching at the invitation of Annabel Goldsmith Ormley Lodge is the house of Sir Jimmy Goldsmith the late Sir Jim and Annabel and just to throw in a little bit of extra information for those of you that don't know, her first husband was Mark Burley, and he named the club Annabelle's after Annabelle Goldsmith, or whatever her name was, presumably Annabelle Burley, when she was mad to him. Um, and uh, for my money, that's the most fantastic thing about the woman, that that legendary venue was named after her. It's a little bit pants these days, my dear, but back in the day it was the place, it was Le Club, my dear, of Mayfair. So she has that legacy, that history, and they live in a great they live in a great big fancy house. Well, she still lives there, my dear. And she went on to spawn many little goldsmiths, including Jemima Goldsmith, who went on to marry Imran Khan, and then uh, returned to becoming a goldsmith. She was also famously a great bestie of Diana's. There was Rupert, there are a few more, and there was Zach. Zack Goldsmith, who used to be a bit of a sort back in the day, I've got to tell you my ideas. Zack the Sack. <laughs> Zack the Sack. That's how lots of my chums refer to him. Teabagging, my dear, teabagging. Anyone for a lovely cup of tea? Well, they were lunching together, presumably the three of them. Christina, Elizabeth and Annabel Goldsmith. And... Uh, they were joined by Princess Michael of Kent, unexpectedly. Yes, Mary Crusty, Mary Christine, almost said Crusty, my dear. Mary Christine rode into Ormley Lodge on horseback. And the astonishing thing was that she was full term. Yes, she was pregnant, eight or nine months pregnant, ready to burst. She rode in through Richmond Park. Christina seems to think there might have been a paddock or stable locally, which is why, why she was in the area. She rode to Ormley Lodge and joined them for the occasion. For those of you who aren't aware, Princess Michael of Kent is a relation of Christina Oxenberg via marriage because Christina's cousin is the, uh, the Duke of Kent, Princess Alexandra and Prince Michael of Kent. I don't mean to teach you how to suck eggs, my dear. Many of you know all this, but 
tens of thousands watch, so I like to put them in the picture. Christina told me, Marie Christine is a large woman, so imagine the horse that must bear her. <laughs> a true ton, a true ton is how Christina described, not Marie Christine, but the horse, a true ton to bear the load of this large woman. As I say, Marie Christine is six foot tall and well built. Post lunch, Princess Elizabeth asked if she could ride the horse. She wanted to have a little trot around the park, so they all moved across the street to the paddock area on the field, and the Princess Elizabeth had a little canter around the field. She toured the paddock. Then little Christina asked for a ride. Little Christina Oxenberg, who I call Bergie rather affectionately. We have pet names for each other, you see. She calls me Queen Rivuletta. I call her Princess Bergie. So if you hear me refer to Bergie, you know who I'm referring to. Little Bergie, she asked for a ride when the adults were done. She says she was 14 or 15 years old at most, and I've always been a runt. And she points to how tiny she was and that she felt like a flea on the back of this huge horse that was a true tongue, just a tiny little thing. Well, in fact, and I don't mean to disparage Christina, but her recollection does vary there where she says 14 or 15 years old at most because I did my calculations and if Marie Christine was indeed eight or nine months pregnant and it involved the birth of Freddie or Gabby, which are the only two children that I know about, then this event would have occurred either in April of 1979 or which would have made Christina 16 years old and three months or in April of 1981, which would have made her 18 and three months old. So, Christina dear, I don't mean to disparage, but you were at least 16 years old and three months. So there is a difference there uh, between the size and age of a 14 year old and a 16 year old, but I don't mean to split hairs, but we've got to get facts right here. When you do your memoir, and I want you to do a wonderful, fabulous memoir, my dear, a mummy dearest, if you will, because for those that don't know, Christine is estranged from the rest of her family. Things haven't been too rosy in that area. And Princess Elizabeth, her mother, says that recollections often vary when it comes to Christine. Well, Christine has been kind enough to respond to me. And so I will recount her details, but I must make corrections along the way where I find it necessary. When you release that memoir, my dear, when you release that tome, pass it by me for some fact checking, my dear, pass it by me. Otherwise, you're going to come in under all kinds of aspersions as the spare did for his recollections via J.R. Moeringer. But regardless, 14 or 16, she was still a young slip of, the, of a thing and the grown-ups left her alone with the horsey. The horse then became aware of their departure. And with this flea on its back, as Christina describes herself, it vermoosed, it vermoosed to try and find the party. And you know what? I know how horses can be. So many members of my family are great with horses, but because I was busy uh, playing musical instruments and with other hobbies when I was young, and I was never especially sporting, uh, I didn't get into horse riding till I was, I think, approaching 10, rather late uh, for my sort of world, I'm afraid. And if you don't start young, it never really becomes a great love and a great passion. And it didn't with me. And I was given this huge, great big hulking horse. It sounds like this one, Christina. I was given a huge, great big true ton of a horse called Betsy. And I can remember my siblings had really lovely horses, but I had this great big hulk called Betsy. And she loathed me. She could smell the bit of fear that I had about her, to be honest, but she loathed me from the offing. And animals usually are rather fond of me, but she didn't like me. And I didn't ride her well, in all honesty, because I was I never felt safe on horseback. And there was one occasion where she shoved me against, I was a strider, and she shoved me against the wall and dragged me along this wall. And it was a sort of textured wall that had little spiky bits coming out. But she dragged me, I was wearing denims, uh, denim jeans and, you know, riding boots and the rest of it. But it managed to sort of puncture the material. It dragged me along the wall and I was all grazed up. I hated that horse. <laughs> I know I'm digressing, dear, but the devil's in the detail. I understand how scary these things can be. Well, anyway, the horse, 
it galloped away. And if you're distressed by hearing about, you know, these misadventures of animals and the trouble they get into, well, switch off, switch off, my dear. But it ran out of the park into traffic because these serene parks in London, they're all surrounded by heavy traffic, my dear. And Christina says it mashed up cars, you know, this four-legged creature, this beast, as she described it, mashed up cars. Christina flew off like a flea and hit a lamp post. So after all these decades, after all the rounds that this story has done in the drag clubs and the gay clubs and all the gossipy kiki bars, it was not the horse that hit a lamp post. It was Christina Oxenberg, our dear Bergie. She hit the lamp post and the lights went out. <laughs> that's, that's, we can blame the lamp post, dear. <laughs> No, I shouldn't be naughty, should I? Bergie's mother, Princess Elizabeth, then arrived on the scene. There were tears. There were tears. And Christina is often accusing her mother, Princess Elizabeth, of, I don't know, perhaps sort of narciss narcissistic hysterics that aren't necessarily real, but are more of an act. I don't want to put words in Christina's mouth there, but I get the impression that the tears were a little bit of drama, a little bit of show from Christina's perspective. But they were both placed in an ambulance. And this was after the horse was hit again, after it mashed up some cars, it was hit by another car directly. And it happened to be being driven by a doctor this car that was involved in the crash and the doctor administered to both casualties to the horse and Christina Oxenberg and uh, finally after they had taken away ambulance the horse then had to be shot and put out of its misery it had compound fractures to the legs so very sad very sad no one really to blame Eventually, Christina was discharged from the hospital. She was in pain, but she was okay. There was nothing serious. Crushed ribs was the extent of it. And they all, well, Christina and her mother returned to Princess Elizabeth's house, which was on King's Road, narrow, tall affair on King's Road. And up on the fourth story is where Princess Elizabeth's bedroom was, the royal boudoir. Christina was in pain, a young sip of, the, of a thing, she tells us, but Princess Elizabeth summoned her and asked her to make a cup of tea. And, uh, well, this didn't sit well with the young Christina because she was in pain. She asked her to make a cup of tea and Christina had to go all the way down to the basement kitchen, the basement kitchen, four flights of stairs, four stories, had to traipse up and down holding her crushed ribs in pain, my dear, in the wake of a horse dying as well. So I think Christina wants to make that point. I have no disparagement at all towards Princess Elizabeth of Yugoslavia, but her daughter does. So I'm just letting you know from her angle that she wasn't pleased as a young child in pain to be sent up and downstairs, upstairs, downstairs. You know, this is the domain of servants. Christina says rather archly, but it was I who got her. I thought. The very next day, Princess Elizabeth bade little Bergie write to Princess Michael of Kent to write to her and apologise, despite nearly dying. Christina obliged and in due course received a reply from Marie Christine. Now, this is the bit that is very hard to swallow. I really hope that your recollections do vary here, my dear, because... If what you're saying is true, I think it is rather cruel of Princess Michael of Kent. I would be interested to know if you still harbour the letter, my dear. It could do very well on eBay, or if you want somewhere as a repository. I would, I would be very pleased to receive this note. But this letter from Princess Michael said that Christina is a horse killer and a murderer. A horse killer and a murderer and that she would never get over it. <laughs> I really shouldn't laugh at that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'm not laughing at the horse's death to those joyless, humorless old pikes out there with no sense of humor. I'm laughing at the whole, the whole campery of this incident. <laughs> a horse killer and a murderer and she would never get over it. What I wouldn't give to read that letter, my dear. Well, all three were traumatized by this incident. I mean, it's rather awkward, isn't it? Rather awkward. But they all got over it. And Christine was rather magnanimous about this. She says they are very close today. As close as you can be when you see each other once every 20 years, you know. She says they're very close. She says that the royal family, you know, it's a sprawling family. It's a sprawling family, but there is a lot of love. And her words are, even though we are not close, we are loyal. They are loyal. Although I'm not sure where all of your loyalties are laying at the moment, my dear, or if any of your cousin's loyalties are in sympathy with yours or your mother's. It would be very interesting to know. I know that you are a fan of the Harkles and you are rather disparaging about the royal family at the moment. But what I love about uh, Marty, uh, not Marty, Christine, Christina, what I love about little Bergie is that she and I have a different point of view at this moment in time about current circumstances, but we are able to really just have a civilised chat about it, a civilised discussion with absolutely no disparagement, absolutely no, you're right, I, blah, 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 just a nuanced bit of conversation. Because it was exactly as I, I mentioned in the broadcast yesterday when I spoke about good and evil and how there is a whole spectrum of grey area in between and right and wrong and truth and fiction. You know, life is very nuanced, not binary in that way. And, you know, I appreciate that two grown adults with perhaps different points of views can learn from each other and have an air of civility. And I know for those of you who, who have warned me off of Christina Oxenberg, and I appreciate that you mean it in a caring way, but I am not naive. I know that she can turn around at any moment and take a great big dump on me from a huge height. I am aware of that. But... She strikes me as a woman who lives with a lot of hurt and pain. And some of that is dealt with humour. And the thing I like about her is her humour. But she is a woman that carries a lot of hurt and pain. Some say she inflicts hurt and pain on other people as well. I do not know enough about the situation or about her to comment on that. But hurt people can hurt people. Also, hurt people can be very compassionate people. And she certainly illustrates compassion in some quarters to some people and similarly she notices that I can show compassion to even those who I disparage such as Harry and Meghan from time to time and that is why when she rocked up here and noticed me and reached out to me in the spirit of trying to convince me of the error of my thoughts when it comes to Harry and Meghan and Catherine and William that is why we were both able to talk and Focus on the common ground that we share instead of any disparities. It's called civility and it's something that is very much lacking in this modern world, very much lacking. Thanks for sharing your tea or coffee break with me, my dears, or if you're sipping a glass of wine, cheers and bottoms up. I appreciate your company. If you enjoyed story time, my tip jar is in the privy purse description box below. And do leave me a juicy comment. I would love to know if you're aware of any royal tales of folklore that you want to know about and hear about or perhaps you're in the know perhaps you've got connections and you would like to impart some information to me to titillate both myself and my fruities in the basket that would be wonderful do let me know i'll catch up with you soon my dear toodle pip and stay royal won't you ta -ra.